I am back at Pensbury Manor, and guess what? I'm going to explore how ale was made in 1683 right here in the brew house. I'm going to utilize the kitchen house to create the food that I envision goes extremely well with ale. I'll be making sausage dumpling with cremini mushroom, warp sausage simmered in ale, and a fantastic potato that is cooked with sage and sausage. All for a taste of history from Pensbury. Huzzah! Huzzah! Wow, spectacular. A Taste of History is made possible by Sandals Resorts, the luxury included vacation. What is better to go with ale than sausage? I do not know. Today I'm making a very nostalgic recipe that I used to make in way, way back when in the Black Forest, which is basically a sausage dumpling. This would be something we would serve like almost every Sunday. And when you make sausage, you always have little scraps, a little leftover, they must recycled into this dish. So basically I have what we call veal sausage in here, and I have some rope sausage, which is all pork. So I'm taking some of the rope sausage, And here we go. So if you wanted to make this recipe, it's very simple. Just talk to your local butcher to give you some of the inside of the sausage, like you see meat here, a pepper flake, because I like a little spice to it. Cream. A little parsley. Now, there might be some recipes you find that put plate crumbs into it. I don't believe in it. So now I'm going to mix it up really good. And the best way to mix that is with your hand. It doesn't need salt at all. It's right in there. Mix it really good. Bring the pot over from the heart and scoop those guys into it. A little chicken stock, a little beef stock, anything could work. I have my mixture. I take it in my hand and here they go. Now obviously you can make that any size you want. You could even, if you wanted to, make them larger, make them smaller. There's really, seriously, no right, no wrong at all. You use it in the palm of your hand. So you have it like that. The palm of your hand is kind of gives you the, what shapes the, if you make it into canal. They're almost done already, because the, the, the stock was so hot. So you bring it to a quick boil and you got it. Sausage has a good amount of grease. So what happens is the, the grease in there binds really quick and therefore it floats. Fat floats, that's why it swims so good. <laughs> Let me take one off and see if they're done. Mmm, delicious. It can go off the fire while I get the sauce ready. All right, spider. Now we're making the sauce where the dumplings get mixed under. I have some shallots ready. Only translucent, no color. Now goes mushrooms. Beautiful cremini mushrooms. I got some red wine. Let it simmer for a little bit. I'm reduce that down. Perfect. All right. A little bit of brown sauce. Very little. Any sauce, any brown sauce. You don't need to make no demi glass. more. 
Oh, flavor. Parsley in there, simmer a bit more. This is my trippet that goes great meat ale, which is a sausage dumpling. Any sausage meat would work. You can just use rope sausage, veal sausage, anything in the stack, easy. Oh, even better. Beautiful. Obviously, I picked this dish because this goes great meat beer. Let's find out more about ale in the 17th century. Beer is one of human civilization's earliest beverages, with some evidence of brewing dating as far back as 7,000 BC. Unlike its recreational usage that is common today, beer was a dietary standard throughout history, consumed for sustenance and survival. In the North American colonies, records show that brewing beer was practiced shortly after the settlement of Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. So it's no surprise that while William Penn was establishing the colony of Pennsylvania, he had this palate pleaser readily available. William Penn gets the deed to Pennsylvania in 1681, and in 1682 starts to set up his governance. A staple in the mindset of Europeans was beer. Water wasn't safe to drink. It was more common on the table than bread. You would have seen beer on your table, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When Penn was advertising for people to come to Pennsylvania, one of the posters advertised that the beer in Pennsylvania was as fine as any in London. Beer was so important to daily life that Penn even constructed an entire building separate from his manor house that included not only a kitchen house, but a fully operational brewery. Usually the master brewer in a household setting was a woman. It was the homemaker because in the mindset of the 17th century, this wasn't alcohol. This was food. Malted barley is still the most common grain found in the brewing process today, and one of the core ingredients in the production of this full-bodied beverage. It is believed that adding hops, the flower of a vine-like plant, was added to the beer brewing process by the Germans as early as 1300. In William Penn's day, if something is hopped, it's called beer. If it's not hopped, it's called ale. The idea of hopping it does two things. It's bitter, so it counteracts the sugars and balances it to the palate, but more important, it's a preservative, so it extends the shelf life. If you could extend the shelf life, you could brew bigger batches, store them longer, and it was a labor saver. The preservative nature of hops soon led to a popular nickname widely used today, the IPA. Throughout the 18th century, England was fighting to subdue India and needed a way to ship large amounts of beer to their troops without it spoiling. Brewers in England soon discovered that hopping the beer was the answer, and the nickname of the India Pale Ale, or IPA, was born. From dietary essential to recreational libation, beer will undoubtedly continue on as a staple of human civilization. Ale and sausage are a perfect combination. But like most things in the 18th oh, yeah. century, preparing oh, yeah. the sausage from a whole pig was not an easy task. <laughs> Back when I was a kid in the Black Forest of Germany, I used to do that all the time. A critical step of the butchering process is removing the hog's bristly hair, which is incredibly stiff. In fact, the bristles were used for things like paintbrushes. It's important to have the water at somewhere around 160 degrees. If it's too hot, the bristles will burn into the skin, making them impossible to remove. This is a labor-intensive process, but important nonetheless. The butchered pig produces countless amounts of cuts that you see me cook with many times on a taste of history. Cuts like pork belly, pork loin, or pork chop. Sausages are made of all the leftover meat trimmings of the pig from areas like the shoulder, but any ground up pieces of pork can be used. 
They are encased in the animal's clean intestine and ready for the open fire. Such as my next recipe, the ale braised rope sausage. While there are many sausages, one of my favorite is the rope sausage, which is basically just beautiful ground pork. The reason they're called rope sausage, because as you can see, they are no rope. So you want to decide how big a piece you want to cut. For today, I'm figuring about this size. And so I'm going to go like so. Festivals, they have the whole rope sausage on the grill all at once and then just cut it up. So it's going to go right behind me. So basically, you want a pan that's hot. I'm going to put in there, I'm going to put a little bit of oil. I'm going to get a little bit of oil. Oh, it doesn't get better than that. Now remember, those sausages are raw, completely uncooked. So you have to take a time to cook it on a grill or in a pan. And in a couple of minutes I turn them, you're gonna see how beautiful they are gonna brown up. There you go, oh gosh. Huh. Don't get better than that. Look at that, gorgeous. Yep. And I'm gonna deglaze with a little beer right now, just in a couple seconds. And the beer, what makes it unique, especially the beer I'm using today, it's Richard Molasses, adds a lot of flavor into it. So a dark beer, like a Guinness would work. So I'm deglazing. That's what you're looking for. Now I'm gonna cut some onion, throw it in there. The sausage could not be better. It's just simmering away with the, with the ale. Now I'm gonna put some onions in there, not too much, because onions also go on top. That's it, all it needs. Let it simmer a little bit more. Gets a little bit of brown sauce on it. Look how beautiful, oh, gosh. Just imagine that between a, a beautiful roll. What a lunch. I'm gonna set this right next to the fire because it's gotta cook some more. So the rope sausage that is to be deglazed with ale has the onions up sitting next to the fire because you know, hot iron pus attract heat. So they're simmering away nicely. While they're simmering away right now, I'm making what we call in the industry tobacco onions or fried onions. All of this is flour with a little paprika, and I take a couple of onions and just cut it really coarse. Some people always think it's a trick for restaurants to do that. You can do it at home. This goes in here. And we just go like so. You just want to coat them really good. And the paprika is what makes it, gives it a quick browning. Everybody always wants to know how this is done when they come to the restaurant to eat. And there's really nothing to it. When you would make this at home and your pot is too small and it boils over, you keep your house on fire. So I'm recommending that you have at least a pot that is twice as large as the oil that you have in the pot. That is also a great way to serve on a steak. That's a sensational smell for the, the onions cooking in, this, uh, in the oil. So the paprika comes through it. A golden brown, and out they go. Oh yeah. I just put a little brown sauce in there. Not much than that. Get some cream in there, a little cream. Not much, just like so. I got this whole thing ready. Look at that. Oh gosh. So the sausage are done, ale braised. Now I put some sour cream in there, I already put heavy cream in there. Two spoons of sour cream, like so. Now mix this whole thing up. 
And now comes the last most important after that. It's a big amount of Dijon mustard, but with grains in it. We taste it quick here. Wow. Oh, the flavor of the pork sausage, the ale, the onions. Unbelievable. Let's put some mustard in there. Look at that. Oof. It just screams for goodness. Unbelievable. Get some parsley, and I can see the fried onion on top. We are ready to eat. Look at that, perfectly cooked. It's ale in the sauce, it's ale in there. You have the Dijon mustard, you have the sour cream. Just a very good combination. Let's find out how brewing was done at Pensbury Manor. Chef, welcome to the back side of the brew house. I've been smelling everything that you are cooking on the opposite <laughs> side here and I can't wait, but my job is to provide the beer that we're going to have. The diet of the people had moved away from drinking raw water and only the most devastatingly poor people would have drank water. If you could afford to, the middling sort, the middle class, would have been drinking beer. So we started out today by firing up the furnace here, heating up some water. So by boiling the water, they made it sterile. And so the alcohol was a French benefit. Absolutely. <laughs> we have barley that is the main grain ingredient to English brewing that would have been soaked and sprouted here on a brick floor. You want to get this grain to the point where little roots are coming out of it. At that instant, the enzymes are highest and you want to inhibit that. The way to do it was to use a toaster oven. We've got the ovens below. We were toasting the grain in here and you can see the wonderful sure. dark color in the difference between the two grains. The tiger, the color, the tiger, the, the ale. Exactly. We're gonna start out with about five pounds of malt here. Basically, we're going to put our mash in. We've been boiling water, sanitizing it behind you. And the idea is that we will add the water to the grain and let it steep, almost like a tea bag soaking. The longer we let that first batch steep, the more sugars are released, and the more sugars we release, it's the raw material that the yeast is gonna to consume to convert to alcohol eventually. I can put this on my resume, assistant to the brewer. Ideally in the brewing process, we want to bring the water to a boil but actually, if you reach 180 degrees, that's fine for the purpose of brewing and sanitizing. God, the flavor comes out already. It's amazing, huh? You can smell it. Oh, big time. Yeah. So this should bring it up to about 10 gallons of water that we've added. Yep. At this point in the brewing process, you want to slow the cooling down to allow it to steep and release all those wonderful flavors and sugars that are in that grain. It's about an hour and a half to two hours for it to cool down to blood temperature. Somewhere around 98 to 100 degrees. We well, some think. of us have hotter blood than others, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm making a few, what you call home fries, such as fried potatoes. Now, obviously, if you want to spurge, you can just put a little sausage into it. You don't have to. Today, since we have plenty here, I put a little sausage in the back of the spider. Just take the skin off like so and throw it right in the spider behind me. Okay, get a little bit of oil. So it's just a little rope sausage. Uh, anything you got, you don't have to use the sausage either. Just fry it up a little bit for the flavor. I got the potatoes already blanched behind me, which means they are pre-cooked. Sausage is already cooked. Let's put some potatoes in there. Now the potatoes are just regular, any kind of potato. This happens to be Yukon's. And the sage, I'm not going to chop it. Put some of the leaves. No stem, but just a leaf. Beautiful flavor. Potato sausage on the bottom. Couple of pepper flakes in there for a little spice. Put 
some chopped parsley last moment. Mm-hmm. And then we serve it up. That's a serious breakfast. That goes on the bladder. It's for a hungry ale maker. Some parsley in there and then we're not done. So first time ever on a taste of history, I'm trying my new egg spoon that my blacksmith for me made. Obviously in the 18th century, frying an egg <laughs> wasn't that simple, we did heat. So therefore to make a single egg like that it seemed like a logical idea. So this is the first time that I ever tried it and uh, right on top of the potato. So here I got my home fries with sausage and sage with a fried egg on top. There's no real prescription on how often you would want to stir and break up those grains and get the water circulating all around the mash. So the next step in the brewing process would be draining out that wort. So at this point, what we want to do is we want to try to keep as many of these solids up in the top because we will save those and reuse those for the next brewing. The brewing that we're doing is the first brewing, which would make strong beer. Strong beer, you've released the most sugars, and when we would later introduce yeast in the brewing process, the yeast consuming the sugars converts it to alcohol. Gotcha. What I'm doing is loosening up the strom. There's actually a hole in the bottom of this kettle that is plugged by the strom. The bottom of the strom is tapered to configure to a funnel uh -huh. there. And if you listen, we can hear that wonderful wort coming out, and you see that rich caramel color all those great sugars, all that flavor from the grain has been released. Once I fill the bowl, I'll shut off the stream. And I put it into you could put it kettle. into the boiler for me. And my goal is to try to keep as much Solid of the, the solids bottle. up here for the second brewing. Okay, there we go. Oh, that is fantastic. Are we on the right track? Up, oh man, the flavor. I think we're gonna have some good beer here. The magic step that your forefathers in Germany brought to brewing sometime we think around 1300 was hopping the beer. These are hops vines that came right here from the gardens in Pensbury. It provides a bittering effect to counteract all the sugars that are released from the grain, but it's also a preservative. So now we have a hopped wort. After the hops has been skimmed out, we'd allow the hop wort to come to room temperature before introducing yeast. If you introduce it at too high a temperature, it kills, the yeast. it kills the yeast. In a brew house like William Penn's brew house, there was yeast impregnated in all the woodwork here from the multiple brewings that they had. The next day, if we came here and we found that foam on top, we knew that the yeast had taken, and that is the point where take your hopped wort and carefully pour it into your cask until we're right up to the top. We'd actually take a piece of clay with a piece of rye straw coming through it. That yeast is living and it's going to be feeding off of those sugars for the next 10 days to two weeks. After it stops venting, you give it one more day, remove the clay, put the wooden plug in, knock it into place, and they would have probably been kept in order of age. And about a month from when we would have finished and had added the yeast, would be when we would have a finished product that we would want to put on the table with the wonderful fare that you would have prepared with a homemaker. Well, Doc, you know what they say, you can never get too old to learn something. Well, today I definitely learned 18th century brewing technique from the master. So I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because that is, uh, was an experience. Well, as they say, beer is food. There we go. Enjoy your meal. It was a spectacular day being back at Pensbury and cooking this fantastic meal for you guys and seeing how ale was made. So I really, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate you spending the time with me and enjoy the food and all for a taste of history from Pensbury. A taste of history is made possible by Sandals Resorts, the luxury included vacation. 
for the past 10 years, I've gotten so many requests for recipes for my show, A Taste of History. Well, now you can find my favorite recipes in the Taste of History cookbook.